every area in all parts of the world has those area-specific urban legends that just refuse to die. Whether the stories are about a haunted asylum on the outskirts of the city, or or a creature that lives in the nearby woods, or a ghost that haunts a lonely stretch of road outside of town. It's always a common thread within the tales. No one has ever been to these places, seen the creatures, or witnessed any hauntings with their own eyes. The members of every generation who still proclaim that they know someone whose brother's best friend's sister went to that haunted house with 13 floors that used real blood and uh, spiders and it's so scary that no one has ever made it all the way through. Those same people will swear by those stories without ever being able to provide a shred of evidence or a name of someone who could, who could provide proof of these claims. Simply because everyone around here knows that it's a true story. The storytellers eventually pass the tales on to their children, who modify them just enough to keep up with the changing time. And the cycle continues. I'm as skeptical as anyone when it comes to these stories. Seeing as I was like a junkie when I was younger, constantly searching for the most terrifying stories and whatever area of the country I was living in at the time, I made up and I spread stories about haunted pizza parlors in New York. And my cousin! My cousin's encounter with the Jersey Devil, or how my grandfather encountered a feral, human-like demon creature in the woods of Colorado. I even broke the one rule with these stories by putting myself in them. I just took guts in hindsight, because I had to make sure that I always told them the same way. And surprisingly, no one ever called my bluff. And I like to think that I have had some wonderful contributions to various urban legends around the Midwest and Northeastern states. I moved around a lot. There was always a surge of joy whenever I would wander the hills of school and hear one of my classmates retelling my stories to another one of their friends, adding little bits here and there like a, like a massive game of telephone. I knew, of course, that the stories were complete fiction, but I, I stood my ground whenever someone asked me about them. I would even manage to act a little bit, speaking with shaky voice, or looking scared when I would recount a situation that I supposedly experienced myself. I suppose this aspect of my childhood was, was what led me to my current predicament, which I will recount in full for the internet to take from it what they will. I've laid this little introduction out as a sort of disclaimer, aimed particularly at those who will call my story into question. Been like the boy who cried wolf for years. But I ask you, with every ounce of honesty and integrity that I have, that this time, the wolf is real. From my introduction, it's probably apparent that I moved around the country quite a bit in my middle and high school years. See, neither of my parents had anything to do with any branch of the armed forces. They simply I didn't tend to hang around any given place for too long. I suppose it had some sort of effect on me, but I wasn't hurt by it or anything of the sort. Growing up, I was a complete ham. I made friends very easily, was often the class clown, and because of that, I was often disliked by my teachers. Again, this was never an issue, as I was usually in another state by the time the next semester rolled around. My friendships were often fleeting as were any positive relationships that I'd ever had with my teachers. Because of the events that followed, my memory of one teacher in particular was slightly skewed, but I will attempt to give the least biased version of our friendship that I can. Mr. Mays was one of my social studies teachers back in the early years of my high school experience. Being older now, I can understand how horrible children are to deal with around that age, and I respect him to no end for the way that he was able to connect with his students. He seemed like one of us. He talked like one of us. He made pop culture references that were current, listened to cool music, and sometimes sometimes he would even say hell or damn while he was giving a passionate lecture about Native American history or something like that. A teacher that swore even a little bit. That was the epitome of cool <laughs> to a freshman in high school. My memory of Mr. Mays mostly stems from the way that he really got into anything that he was doing. The instance that is still very vivid in my mind was, of course, around Halloween of my sophomore year. Mr. Mays was 
The kind of teacher that would do those typical decorations around the classroom. Smiling jack-o'-lanterns, black cat cartoons. Typical and boring in the mind of the egotistical high school students. However, on the 31st of Halloween, when most other teachers were rolling their eyes at the fact that teenagers still took dressing up in costumes on Halloween seriously, Mr. Mays took the whole cool teacher thing to a new level. So we walked into the classroom and were surprised to find the blinds drawn. Sheets over the smaller windows, candles lighting the room, a single frowning jack-o'-lantern sitting in a stool in front of the desks. Mr. May sat at his desk. He just watched the students come into the class, take their seats. He didn't have to ask anyone to be quiet because the moment everyone walked into the room, they were either too excited to care about petty conversations or too confused to bother with them. The students took their seats as Mr. Mays began his lecture. He spoke quietly to set the mood, and he took a seat on a chair right next to the jack-o'-lantern in the center of the room. Today is probably my favorite day of the year, class, he said, in this monotonous voice. Halloween is my favorite holiday, and I want to share with you exactly why I love it so much. One girl raised her hand with a concerned look on her face. I'm pushing the due date for your papers to next Tuesday, said Mr. Mays, without bothering to look at the girl, who slowly put her hand down, looking around at the other students with a hint of embarrassment. The class erupted in this quiet cheer, and Mr. Mays waited for the inevitable silence. He began his story immediately after the class had calmed down. I will attempt to recreate the amazing story that Mr. Mays had told the class that day, and the the way in which he told the story that rendered the horror junkies speechless and the rest of the class terrified. The same girl that had raised her hand to ask about the paper was holding her knees to her chest by the end of it, a look of terror on her face. The important thing to know was what the story was about. See, the specifics slip my mind now, and they aren't too relevant. I'll try to recount the parts of the story that matter the most, but don't hold me to it. Basically, Mr. Mays and his friends set out on a road trip around the country after they had graduated college. They took a truck, loaded it with camping gear, and set out sightsee for the entire summer. The group went from New Jersey, down the coast of Florida, New Orleans, California, and up to Washington. From there, they went to the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and then back home to New York. This concept of the freedom to travel anywhere had the entire class hooked in an instant. Mr. Mays was the coolest teacher ever in my eyes. And being adventurous college kids, the group didn't bring a map. There were no time constraints, so they just kind of drove in the general direction that they wanted to go. And eventually, they found a town to stay in or someplace that looked interesting. He told us that after spending a week in Colorado, he and his friends had to travel through miles and miles of corn, plains, and more corn. He assumed that they were in either Nebraska or Kansas, and they decided to pool their extra cash and stay in a hotel for the night. They settled into a motel in some town that Mr. Mays could barely remember the name of, when one of his friends realized that they were somewhere near his grandfather's farm. He wasn't entirely sure where it was, but being adventurous college kids, they decided to get a quick refund from the motel and try to contact the friend's grandpa. They were unable to get a hold of the grandpa on the phone. So the group figured that it would be fun to just show up. Mr. Mays' friend was adamant that his grandparents would take them in, feed them without a moment of hesitation. So the group set out with an hour of sunlight and seeking the salvation of a comfortable house to stay in. In Kansas, or Nebraska, wherever it may have been, there aren't a whole lot of natural markers that can guide lost travelers. Any directions given to someone who didn't live around the area basically amounted to go up a couple miles to the corn and take a right down on a dirt road, one to the other corn, and there should be some wheat on your right, so, so as is most cases in scary stories, the group got lost. Never wanting to admit defeat, they drove into the night, making wrong turns every five minutes until they found themselves in a wooded road Mr. Mays' friend was certain that his grandparents lived off of. And Mr. Mays described the road as basically a dark path to hell. I wasn't entirely sure how true this was because he got very excited and a bit 
ridiculous with his explanation of the trees that almost tried to grab the car and the red eyes of countless animals looking at them from the darkness. Regardless, the typical horror tropes worked in at least most of the class. Everyone was terrified, so the group of guys drove on this dark road for about 15 minutes before they came to a clearing in a small building with lights on. It seemed to be a silo. They figured that, at the very least, the people who lived here would be able to help them find where the guy's grandpa lived. The whole idea of everyone knows everyone in these hick parts of the country fueled his hopes. They pulled up the car near the building, realizing when they were out of the car that it appeared to be the kind of place where one would store uh, a whole bunch of chickens, not a home. Still, the lights were on, so they figured that they would give it a try. They approached the building as a group, looking in the semi-open sliding door to find a big, empty room. Hanging fluorescent lights lit the room like it was daytime. They couldn't see a soul. There were no cars, but one of Mr. Mace's friends was convinced he'd seen someone as they pulled up. So they decided to go inside and see if there was an office or something where someone might still be working. Or why else would they have this huge place lit up like this? There were no doors on the inside of the building. Again, it was just a giant, empty hall. So the group roamed around the property and over towards the silo, and as they got closer, they noticed what appeared to be a cellar door. Now, at this point, I remember Mr. Mays telling the entire class to learn from his idiocy. He told us that he hadn't seen many horror movies before that time, and didn't think twice about approaching a creepy cellar door in the middle of a dark, scary, foreign place. He said that approaching the door was one of his biggest regrets. Mr. Mays let the whole class know that he was going to tell us as much as he deemed appropriate about the experience. He felt that we were mature enough to handle it, but advised anyone that was squeamish to leave the class early. Well, several students quickly gathered their things and walked out the door, a couple of them being stoners who saw this as an opportunity to go smoke behind a school before the next class. I didn't even give the announcement a second thought. And like I said, I was, and I am, a sucker for this kind of stuff. And Mr. Mays was telling a story better than anything I had ever conjured up. I wanted to learn from this guy. Even though I didn't believe much of the story. After the class had thinned a bit, Mr. Mays continued with the story. He told the remaining few that he and his friends opened that cellar door, releasing a smell that he only described as the most putrid thing my senses have ever experienced. The group was no longer concerned with finding the owners of the property, but was now set on finding the source of that smell. They went down the steps into the cellar, which was lit by a single bulb spaced sporadically along the ceiling for a you know, long hallway. No one ever spoke. Things had gotten too strange. The walls were lined with metal sheeting, similar to the roofing on farms. The hallway itself was crooked, the ceilings constantly lowered in rows like a, a tunnel that had been hastily dug and had never touched up. There were sections where the boys had almost crouched in order to pass. The worst part, Mr. Mays told us, was that the light bulbs continuously flickered, sometimes acting like a strobe light. And, making it very difficult to move through the winding and unstable hallways. In hindsight, he was certain that his mind was playing tricks on him, but he remembered seeing flashes of things that couldn't be there. He said that when you're that focused on something, or if you're that nervous, your mind can do that to you. You can simply revolt, showing you things or people that aren't there. He, he continued to describe the hallway, and I was on the edge of my seat. The halls were windy and seemed to go on forever. Mr. Mays guessed that they were somewhere under the creepy forest that they had driven through when they found the door. But he couldn't be sure. He said that they came upon a door after walking for what felt like a mile. It was simple and wooden, but it looked like it had belonged outside of a, of a suburban home. It had a nice design, seemed to be freshly painted red, and had a very nice knob and knocker on it. It was a door that belonged to the entrance to a nice house, not one that was sitting in a dirt tunnel in the middle of nowhere. His friends walked towards the door, moving carefully because the flashlights and the, the bulbs were increasingly uncertain about the stability of the surrounding walls. He turned to the group, the rest of which were 
nervous at the very least, and he attempted to lighten the mood with a laugh before he said, I should probably knock first. Mr. Mace's friend grabbed the steel knocker and hit it against the door several times. Quietly uttered, Anyone home? The group waited about 30 seconds before their tension broke. The guy next to the door shrugged his shoulders and went to walk back to his friends, but as he did, the light bulb between them surged and exploded. The boys shielded their eyes and looked back to their lone friend by the door. As he lowered his hands, one of the metal sheets of the makeshift rope dropped. The edge of the sheet fell directly under the boy's forehead, slicing it open and sending a wave of blood down his face. The impact apparently knocked him out, and he fell back against the door, knocking it open in the process. The entirety of the group rushed through the dim light to his friend, barely noticing the seemingly pitch-black room that now lay before them. Mr. Mays was the first to make it to his friend's side. He lifted the guy's head onto his shoulders and immediately taking off his jacket and putting it over his forehead to in, a, in this attempt to stop the bleeding. Once the group had calmed down, Mr. Mays noticed that the arm that had been bracing his friend's head was soaking wet. He was confused about this, and he was attempting to sort it out when one of his friends started talking. He said something about the, the lines of the, the lights, and uh, the, they had to go. When Mr. Mays took notice, You know when you turn off a light, he told the class, and... Everything is almost pitch black except the light of the bulb dying, cooling down. It was like that. There were so many of them. These 20 light bulbs had lit the room seconds ago, and now only look like little stars in the darkness. That was definitely terrifying. But that wasn't the scariest thing. There was still a very dim light coming from the hallway behind them. No, it was weak, it lit the room just enough to see the ten people standing less than ten feet in front of them. Mr. Mays' friend went to say something else as one of the bulbs to their right flickered to life. Now let me, let me interrupt this at this point to say that Mr. Mays was a generally playful guy. He had that tone of voice that makes you, makes you want to respond. You know, basically he could say... Let's go jump off a cliff, guys. And you would want to respond with, All right, Mr. May, show us the way. And that's a ridiculous statement, but it gets to the point across. You know, he was a charismatic guy. The whole story up to this point had been like a campfire story. Yeah, the voice inflections of someone attempting to be mysterious and scary, which worked, were noticeable. At this, this point in, in this tale, I could recall the change completely. He was no longer attempting to spook anyone. I could tell that this section was difficult for him. Either he was a very good actor, it, it was it was really a terrifying memory for him to relive. He told us that the light bulb came to life and illuminated the group of people in front of him. In the dim light, he could see children. At least twenty of them in just just the visible light. They were all dressed in nightgowns that looked to be tattered and torn. Stained dark with something. And their hair was long. Every single one of them looked like they had not had a haircut since birth. Some of the children were almost completely obscured by the length of it. Every single one of them. They didn't appear to have seen a shower or a nice bath in their entire life. Mr. Mays told us that the most terrifying part of the whole thing was that none of the children were moving. They were all standing, staring. Most of them visible from the faint light reflecting off their eyes. His whole group was paralyzed with fear for several seconds when they heard what sounded like an animal in the distance yelping. The way it was described was like the sound of a dog crying, multiplied by ten. It spurred the group to life, and just as the children began to step forward, his friends grabbed the injured one and lifted him up out of the room and into the hallway in an instant. Mr. Mage took another second to move and had difficulty finding his bearings. He reached to his left in an attempt to find a wall to lean against and ended up finding a handle. Then he pulled hard, never losing his vision on the children. He bolted for the door right as he noticed what he had grabbed onto, a shower head protruding from a cement wall, reaching maybe a foot into the room. 
There was something leaking from it, but it was too dim to tell what it was. He realized that it had been leaking onto him, but he didn't care. There was now children stammering towards him as he animal cried in the distance and his friends were seriously injured. He, he left the room and he made a point to emphasize that he could make out several more shower heads on the wall near the single dim light bulb. This is why I call them the showers, Mr. Mace told the class. I was transfixed, sitting as far forward as my desk would allow. Bracing for more, I, I slammed the door right behind me, he said, and I ran through the hallway faster than I could have ever run before or since. I made it back to the car, we drove out and out of there like a bat out of hell, and a couple students snickered at the use of the word hell. So when you're trick-or-treating tonight, make sure that you know exactly where you're headed, and don't go out to any abandoned farmhouses. I mean, there aren't many houses here, but you're all smart kids, except Jerry. The class laughed, and the mood lightened as the bell rang for passing period. Mr. Mays turned the light on, reminding them about the paper due next week, and told us to have a safe and happy Halloween. Students all around me were abuzz with theories about the story that they had just heard. I, I bet it's some kind of crazy Nazi hideout, said one girl. I think it's all ghost babies that were killed by a dog, said another. I couldn't theorize in the slightest. I was still caught up in the moment. The way that Mr. Mays had told the story, and the... The detail that he included in it, it left me feeling like we didn't get the whole story. A couple days later, staying after class and asking him about how it really ended and what happened to his friends, he, he laughed, said that his friend was fine, that it was, honestly, he whispered this part probably due to some of the drugs that they were on at the time. Mr. Mays winked at me as if to say, don't tell anybody about the drugs bit, kid. And I smiled and I left. I lived in that town for another couple of months, and then we rapidly moved halfway across the country to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Twisted the story around, I told it around the campfire as I got older, and it was always a hit. But I always changed the ending, letting the friend die of blood loss or being dragged away by the children. It wasn't until college that I got a chance to talk to Mr. Mays again. I went to college in northern New York, not for any reason associated with the story. College was fun, you know, I, I continued being the same ham that I'd always been. I, I wasn't, it wasn't until sometime around junior year that I ran into Mr. Mays at a bar that I frequented. Initially I couldn't be sure that the person I saw laying with his head buried in his arms at the bar was Mr. Mays. The only trait that grabbed my attention was a sweater that he used to wear on his birthday during class. The shirt simply read, I'm the birthday boy. <laughs> I told my group of friends to grab a table, and that I'd join them in a second. Then I walked over to a man at the bar. Mr. Mays? I said. And the man looked up. The man took a, a second to look at my face before he smiled, put a hand on my shoulder and said, Hey there, son. How have you been? I could smell some strong whiskey on his breath. His cheeks were flushed and look in his eyes told me that he was three sheets into the wind. But I had no idea who I was. Hey, Mr. Mays, it's me, Jack. I was, uh, I was a student of yours a couple of semesters about six or so years ago. His face changed a bit, and a genuine look of recognition set in. He took a calmer tone, he smiled, he said, How have you been, Jack? We talked probably a solid 20 minutes. I told him what I'd been doing for the last several years. He told me, and apparently he was still teaching at the same school, doing the same old shtick, as he called it. And I asked him if everything was all right, and he said they were as good as they were ever going to be, and as as they were ever bad. It took me a while to realize that I was an adult that was having a conversation with another adult. Every time I had spoken to Mr. Mays previously, I'd been in the student-teacher relationship, and now I was, a, I was a guy having a drink with a friend at the bar. My friends eventually left, I continued to drink with Mr. Mays. He told me all, all about his divorce, his kids, things that I never would have cared about previously, but now I cared. He was a real person to me, not just some idol anymore. This was a, this was a guy who had real problems, not the infallible teacher that I once thought he was. It had been several hours before I even brought up his story about the showers. I told him about my history with urban legends and scary stories, and he just laughed. 
When I mentioned the story that he had told us years ago, he almost seemed uncomfortable. He finished his whiskey, signaled for another, and then, then he turned to me and he got very serious. Listen, Jack, I don't know why I kept telling that story year after year. His words were slurred and my hearing was messed up, but we both were sufficiently blitzed at this point. That was what my therapist told me to do when I was younger. I had to tell people it, to come up with, with a way to, to get to grips with it or some shit. He took a big swig from his drink. It's your therapist, he said. Mr. Mays laughed heartily and he looked at me. Of course, Jack, you think something like that wouldn't fuck a person up? I was confused, but I smiled nonetheless. Things had gotten very strange. But I mean, you said that you were on all you were on drugs or something, right? No one was too terribly hurt. You were all okay, right? He got almost cartoonish with the sadness in the next several seconds. Of course we didn't, Jack. Why do you think I'm here right now? I was puzzled. Quickly filled with a thousand questions that I wanted to ask him, but I, I let him carry on. Tim, fucking, he, he, he didn't make it, Jack. He laughed. His laugh turned suddenly to tears. Fucking took him, he did. I don't even know. Cops told us that he, that we were just drunk. That he wandered off, got taken by wildlife. He didn't know. He didn't see it, Jack. I was absolutely stone-faced at this point. Mr. Mays was carrying along like I, I knew the actual story, but I didn't. His friends disappeared. I didn't know. I wish... I wish they'd found his body, though. Then we could have shown them inside. It's a bad place, Jack. I don't know anything else to say. It's a bad place. He carried on for a few minutes. It was friend, the fun that they had before they went on that trip, and I let him talk. It was, it was only a few minutes later that his phone rang. Oh, sweetheart, he spoke into the phone. Uh, I'll be out in a few seconds. I, he gagged. Love you, baby. The person on the other end of the phone hung up, and Mr. Mays got up to leave. It's been nice seeing you, Jackie. You got a good head on your shoulders. Make sure you use it. I began to walk out of the bar and Mr. Mays, I yelled after him. Yeah, Jack. He didn't back towards me. Would you say all that showers business took place? Where? Hell, didn't I mention it? It's somewhere outside of Broken Bow, Nebraska. It's fucking hell on earth, if you ask me. Mr. Mays walked out of the bar after waving to me and running into the wall before eventually finding the door. That was the last time I would ever see him. I'd never been able to tell him the impact that he had on my life. Or rather, the impact that his story had on me. He'd never know about the trip we took after graduation. Almost mimicking the one that he and his friends had made, he'd never know that the things he saw at that place were real. You know why? <laughs> I mean, he, he died. About a month later, his liver failed on him. It's all right, though. Because his family was with him in the hospital room. He got to die around people that cared about him. And that, that's all I can ask for from a man like that. I experienced that place too. Several years later. It's where my story turns. The following is a story of how I came to find the showers. And why. I'll never, ever go anywhere near Nebraska ever again. I'll finish the story when I'm sober. The memory is clear enough. I'm awake now, semi-sober and ready to finish this up for you guys. The internet and uh, whoever else cares, I guess. Um, I didn't find out that Mr. Mays had passed away until a couple months after the funeral service. Initially, I was going to seek out his family in order to send my condolences, but it wasn't as if Mr. Mays and I were best friends or anything like that, so I refrained. I continued through my college career and graduated a year or so after our bar meeting. Graduating with English as my major wasn't a mistake, but it wasn't exactly... Uh, you know, wasn't exactly something that landed me any sort of immediate job after college. Now, 
I had saved a pretty solid amount of money while I was in school and decided that I deserved a bit of a vacation, if you will. I took my spare cash, got together with a college buddy Steve, packed up and hit the road, aiming for somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. I had lived in Littleton, Colorado when I was younger and remembered loving the area, so this destination was as good as any. The trip was a success. We made it around Estes Park, Colorado and found a cheap cabin we rented for about a month. The days were filled with lounging, hiking, generally things that involved little to no work on our parts. After our rental was through, we packed up again and headed on our way back east. Now, sometime during this trip, we had met up with a couple Estes Park natives in one of the local bars. We never typically hung out with them or anything like that, but we had just had conversations now and then over drinks and food. One night, these guys were paying their tab and packing up to leave awfully early, and they were usually there until the wee hours of the morning. When we questioned them about it, they told us that they had headed to a little get-together with some friends of theirs, and they invited us. Having nothing else to do, we hopped in the car and followed them to the party. The party itself was very low-key and ultimately very inconsequential to the story. However, the important thing about it was that at some point in the night, we were all sitting around the fire and swapping ghost stories. At this point in my life, I wasn't very much of a ham as I was in my younger years, but with a little bit of encouragement, I started on a couple of the stories that I remembered telling in my youth. Eventually, I made it to Mr. Mays' story about the showers. Every time that I had told it after hearing it from Mr. Mays, I had spiced it up a little bit, but some sort of subconscious respect for my former teacher, I went straight into the version that he told my class in my sophomore year of high school. The group enjoyed my stories, for the most part, the showers being the mutual favorite amongst the partygoers. Steve and I left for the cabin about maybe five in the morning, and he asked me about the story on the drive home. I told him all about Mr. Mays and the class and my love for everything horror-related and whatnot, and he suggested that we try to find the place on our return trip to New York. Initially, I was reluctant simply because I didn't feel like aimlessly wandering through Nebraska for days looking for some old farm building that was probably demolished at that point, but but a couple of days before we left Colorado, I told Steve that it sounded like fun. We weren't going to be able to do another trip like this for a long time, so I figured that we might as well make the best of it. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought of it as a little tribute to Mr. Mays. The guy that, in retrospect, helped me realize that I wanted to be a writer. We left Colorado and we made a long, boring, and barren drive to Broken Bow, Nebraska. Or hell on earth, as Mr. Mays had put it. We found a motel in town, we hung around for a couple of days, venturing out a uh, hundred miles or so in any given direction each day. I remember that Mr. Mays telling us that it was somewhere outside of Broken Bow. But I don't think he got any more specific than that. We tried asking the townsfolks if they had any information about the showers. But we were usually met with blank stares or eye rolling when we told them what exactly this place was. The only person who seemed to know anything about it was an elderly woman who worked at this gas station on the outskirts of town. I don't recall her name, but this woman was just one of those cheerful old people. Very helpful. Generally interested in what anybody had to say to her. Steve had started talking to her at checkout, and she asked about our license plate, commenting that we were very far from home. We had nowhere in particular to be, so Steve and I ended up talking to this woman for about 15 minutes, at which point we brought up a hunt for this place known as The Showers. Initially, the name didn't ring any bells, which made sense, seeing as Mr. Mays had just given it the name after his experience there. But when I began to describe the details, ones I remembered from the story. The friendly old woman interrupted me. The tone was not scornful or mean in any way, but she became very, very terse and deliberate with her words from that point on. People don't deal with anything related to that sort of business around here anymore, she told us. That was all a long time ago. Following her statements... She attempted to be cheerful again, excusing herself to the restroom, wishing us the best on our return trip to New York. Steve and I returned to the car without a word, 
both of us were thinking about what the lady had said again. She didn't seem to be angry at all. She just didn't want to hear another word about it. Now, we were driving back to the hotel before Steve said anything. I mean, if I had to live in a place associated with an urban legend or anything like that, I would totally mess with anyone who asked about it, he said. I mean, eventually, you just get tired of people asking about it, and so you'd just try to scare them to get them to shut up, wouldn't you? I agreed with Steve, and I kept driving. The whole experience wasn't sitting right with me. This was some sort of well-known legend in the area. Why didn't no one else in the town seem to know anything about it? But I'm, I managed to shrug it off. Mind you, neither of us were scared of finding the showers. This little excursion on our road trip was more like a scavenger hunt, a, a cap-off, to an overall relaxing vacation. Steve and I were basically like tourists, hunting for the site at which a famous movie was filmed or something like that. We went into the whole situation with little to no expectation and a fleeting hope that we would be able to find this place. We spent another day in Broken Bow before we took our next trip out to find the showers. Nebraska isn't as terrible of a place as people make it out to be, but it really isn't all that exciting. We found a bar, we spent some time there, and that was just about the extent of our activity on our day off. When we did get back on the road, we decided that we would attempt to stay off the main road for as much of the day as we could. I knew that was... No way that this place was going to be off the highway. And I remembered some detail about a dirt road in Mr. Mays' story. So we went looking for those. This was a fairly futile effort. See, most of Nebraska is just dirt roads. It was 7 in the morning when we came upon a small but thick forest. I use this term lightly, but for Nebraska, this place was like an oasis. The trees were full and thick, shrouding most of its insides in darkness. The sun was setting, and, and even though we had run into a few of those random crops of trees, we agreed that this one showed more promise than any of the others. It wasn't really a road, but there were, it looked to be a path where a dirt road might have been at some point. So we drove along that. If the car was able to handle the Rocky Mountains, I'm like, a dirt path in Nebraska would be no trouble. We moved slowly and carefully along this trail, making sure to clear any fallen trees in the road or rocks, that would render the car useless. When the sun finished setting, it was pretty dark in its place during the day. When the night came, that was something else entirely. I had an inkling at this point that we had found the right place, but I didn't want to jinx it. So we continued onward. I didn't realize it at the time, but the little bits of light that managed to penetrate the canopy in this miniature forest actually did make it look as if the tree's branches were trying to grab the car, just like Mr. Mays had mentioned in the story. I'm still convinced that he made up that part about the animal eyes, though. The most aggressive creature in the woods that we saw was a dead rabbit on the side of the trail. It didn't have any obvious signs of death. It just, just looked like it simply laid down and never bothered to get up. We drove around in the darkness for quite a while before we found a clearing, we had to move several smaller clusters of branches out of the way before... But right in front of our exit was a giant, dead monster of a tree. There's no way that we're moving this one. We got out, turned on the bright headlights in hopes of maybe illuminating the area in front of us. Now there was this feeling of excitement mixed strangely with fear. And I saw what laid 50 feet beyond the clearing. There lit partially by the headlights of the car and a little bit of light from the crescent moon was what appeared to be an old barn house. This wasn't a typical farmhouse. It was larger than the barns that I'd seen in films and didn't have any sort of crest. It, it basically looked like a small warehouse. I wasn't entirely sure at this point if this was the place we were looking for, but this was definitely the closest that we had come. I moved through the brush until I was roughly 20 feet from the entrance, at which point all the growth seemed to stop. I don't know if the owners had done something to the soil, but the whole structure had a border around it that was clear of any sort of plant life. I approached the entrance to the building, a large sliding door, as Steve came up behind me with two flashlights in hand. So you're just going to run off of the place in the dark? He laughed. I gave a half-hearted chuckle and grabbed one of the lights from his hand. 
Mine was a little, but pretty bright flashlight. It was the kind that hikers would most likely fasten their backpacks just in case they were stranded at night. It worked well enough. I grabbed the metal door with both hands holding the flashlight with my mouth and gave it a tug. It moved slightly, creaked a little bit, but there was no way I was doing this by myself. Steve came up behind me and set his flashlight on the ground. He grabbed the door and said, One, two, three! We pulled at the door with all we could muster. Once we had managed to move it a couple of inches, it, it must have latched back onto its track because it slid very easily, stopping hard with a loud echoing thud when it completely opened. Steve picked up his flashlight and walked behind me. I had already moved inside. The inside of the structure was exceptionally bare, almost troublingly so. I wasn't entirely sure how far we were from the nearest home or, or small town, but there wasn't exactly... And I wasn't entirely sure how far we were from the nearest home or small town, but there, there wasn't even the slightest bit of evidence that anyone had been in this building for years. There were no broken beer bottles or empty bags of chips. There weren't even any animal droppings or eager plants that managed to grow up here. The room was expansive, larger than your average farm, but not the warehouse-sized monstrosity that I believed Mr. Mays had described in his story. I was sure that it was simply a holding area for, for farming equipment or, or something similar at some point. To disappointed, I wandered near the entrance while Steve ventured into the expanse of darkness. As I was running over the details of the stories in my mind, something stuck with me like a, like a sack of bricks. In Mr. Maze's story, there was a silo near the barn. I ran outside, my eyes adjusting easily because at the, at the very least it was brighter outside. I looked in all directions, running around the perimeter of the building. Surely, if there was ever a silo near this place, there would be some evidence of it somewhere, but despite my hopes, there was nothing. There was nothing but a cluster of thick, thick bushes on one side. Brush, dirt everywhere. In the forest that we had come from. I walked back into the building, frustrated and tired. Steve was still excited, eagerly running around the inside of the building. Even if I could just find a showerhead or a pipe, he said. Then we'd know that it was true. Just keep looking with me. I didn't want to ruin his excitement. I told Steve the story several times, but obviously he didn't realize that this just wasn't the place. The building was weird, yeah, and it was out of place. Oddly pristine, but it wasn't the location of the showers. I let him explore for a little bit before, before I called him over. This was probably as close as we're going to get, man, I said, but this isn't it. Remember the silo? His face went from excitement to disappointment in an instant. Much like a young child who didn't get the presents he wanted on his birthday. I patted him on the shoulder. This was pretty cool, though. I mean, we'd still tell people we found it. I was reverting back to my old habits quickly. Steve laughed. Yeah, man, I guess, I guess we could. It's definitely creepy, though. We should get some pictures as, uh, as proof, you know? I agreed with him. I'm going to grab the camera real quick, he said, as he bolted out the entrance of the building. I was left alone in the building. It was very quiet. And I was alone in there. I could hear the faint sound of Steve running through the brush and to the car, but once he was far enough away, eventually, everything was quiet. I remember not even hearing wind or the chirping of crickets as I walked deeper into the dark, flashlight in hand. I was convinced that there had to be something. As I approached the far corner of the room, the sound of my feet scraping against the dirt was interrupted by a soft, hollow thud. I stopped trying to figure out what it was. I put my foot down hard against the ground and heard it again. I stopped one more time, realizing the floor that I was standing on was covering something hollow. I walked through the wall of the room, looking carefully at the floor to try to spot any holes or gaps, and as far as I had known, it was solid ground. This thing sat atop, so I was convinced that that I had found a hatch or a basement or something. I I heard Steve coming back through the brush, and I shouted, "Steve, come over here! It's 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 a hole." I, I was trying to as I was trying to say the word hollow. I hopped a bit, hoping to recreate the sound so that he'd be able to hear it upon entering the door. And the second that my feet made contact with the floor, it gave way beneath me. 
The memory of the fall is fuzzy, but I do recall hearing wood splinter. I remember, I remember seeing the light from Steve's flashlight falling away into complete darkness. It wasn't a long fall, but I must have fallen into a terrible position because I know that I was... I lost consciousness for several seconds at least. When I awoke, I was staring at a bright light. For an instant, I thought about approaching the fabled light at the end of the tunnel. I was... I was angry at myself. You died in Nebraska, Jack. <laughs> how do you know? Wow, you do know how to fuck up. My self-depreciation in the afterlife was interrupted by what sounded like Steve's voice. Jesus, Jack. Jack, can you hear me? Dude, wake up. Please wake up, he screamed. I managed to lift my head off the ground just enough for him to celebrate. The pain in my head was immense, but it was... It was outweighed by the pain shooting through my knee. I knew I had a concussion, but the pain in my knee, oh god, it was just, it was so much more pressing. I, I looked around until I found my tiny flashlight and sat up and reassured Steve, I'm okay, I just, it just hurt my knee, I bumped my head too, really hard. Thank fuck, man, I thought you were dead. Imagine that though, dying in fucking Nebraska, that'd be awful. <laughs> His words made me laugh a little, but I stopped myself, the slightest shaking hurt my head and made me incredibly dizzy. Guess the, the rope? Steve? What? I asked quietly. Should I get a rope to get you out of here, or do you, do you see a ladder? I looked around the walls that sat in front of me. They were smooth cement. There's no way that I was climbing out of here. Yeah, get a rope, I told him. It's buried under all of our stuff, I think. It might be in the, the red climbing bag, but I'm not sure. Steve nodded telling me to hang on there and that he'd be back in a little bit. Then he ran off. The silence that followed was uncomfortable. After the sound of Steve's feet scraping the floor above me faded, I was unable to hear the buzzing that occurs in total silence intertwined with the pulsing in my head. I pushed myself over to the nearest cement wall and braced myself against it, resting and breathing deep in an attempt to calm myself. The cement was unnaturally cold against my back. It was... It was summer. It only had a t-shirt on, but it felt like ice, even through that. Again, this observation was primarily made after the fact. A moment, it just felt good to lean against something. I sat there, waiting for Steve in this underground basement, and I began to feel uneasy. I felt like an idiot for falling down here. I felt, I felt pain for my injuries as well. That all seemed to fade into one emotion in an instant when I heard what I could only identify as breathing. Breathing somewhere to my left. I convinced myself that if it was my injured mind playing tricks on me for a few moments until my mind decided to rapidly replay Mr. Maze's story, when I had first heard it in the classroom years before, I was more impressed than I was scared. But now, sitting in this dark basement in the middle of Nebraska, I felt something that I hadn't felt in a long time. It couldn't even be summed up in the word fear as I sat there. I felt, I felt all-encompassing dread. Pointing my flashlight to my left. The direction from which I thought I heard the sound, the light didn't reach the other wall. It was it was too far away, but I, I was comforted to see absolutely nothing there. I breathed deeply for a couple more seconds before I heard another noise in the darkness. It was very quick. I can't be sure that it, it wasn't my own body moving around with my without me noticing, but I thought that I heard scraping sounds. Not ten feet from me. It sounded like it sounded like the noise your feet make when you're walking across a dirt covered floor. And before I could react, I heard the breathing to my left again. Closer this time. There was no way this was real. I, I hadn't seen so much as a spider web in this building, and now I was convincing myself that something was next to me, and it was breathing. I was angry at myself for getting so worked up. I told myself that the human brain is constantly hallucinating. I told myself that, that while in silence or darkness, the brain will still make sounds up to fill the gap, to make you think that you see things that aren't there. I channeled my inner skeptic in order to calm myself. It worked. It worked until I saw a flash of something in front of me. I, I can't... I can't be entirely sure of what it was. But I heard the accompanying sound of feet scraping against the floor and I began to swell with dread. I, I decided that the best course of action was, at this point, it was to turn off the flashlight assuming that if it couldn't see me, they couldn't get to me. Whatever they might be. I turned off my flashlight and I was left in complete, total darkness. 
The bulb of the flashlight faded and cooled as I put it in my pocket, simultaneously pushing back against the cold cement wall in an attempt to stand. I managed to get up on my feet. Oh, foot. I found that I couldn't stand to put any pressure on the injured knee. I limped to the corner, humming to myself, trying to break the deafening silence. I, I called for Steve as loud as I could manage, but I heard no response. He was probably in the back of the car, still still hunting for that rope. There had to be a ladder. There had to be a ladder or something somewhere. I continued to hum, and my heartbeat, which had been, been beating almost out of my chest, slowed to a manageable rate. I moved along the cement wall, keeping my whole body against it and the weight of, off of my injured knee. I, I had traveled what I guessed to be maybe ten feet, and my head made contact with something in front of me. I tumbled to the ground. My cushion must have been amplifying the pain because it was blinding. I reached both hands to my forehead when I felt something warm and wet with my fingers. I searched for a cut anywhere on my forehead, but I couldn't find one. I desperately searched for my flashlight as I sat up and tried to get back against the wall. I grabbed the light in my right hand. I braced against the wall with the other, turned it on, and pointed it into the darkness where I was just, where I was just lying. And there the, there the floor was wet. The dirt had, had modeled the color of whatever the liquid was. I tried to get my eyes to focus on the puddle, tried to convince myself that it was my blood when I saw another drop fall into the puddle. Words lack the ability to describe the way I felt when I, I heard the drip noise again. I saw yet another tiny ball of liquid fall into the puddle. I think I knew even then exactly what the source was, but I was endlessly trying to convince myself that I was wrong. I lifted the flashlight up and pointed it at the source of the liquid. What stared back at me was a pipe. A pipe that protruded at least a foot out of the cement wall. The, the metal was rusted, cracked. Little bits of liquid began to seep from them. At the end of the pipe was a simple shower head aimed down towards the ground. Do you know that feeling when your stomach drops? I think mine literally did. Because I vomited immediately. I got it all over my shoe, but that wasn't the least bit important at the time. I ignored the pain in my knee and I shuffled along the wall as fast as I possibly could. I heard noises, but I couldn't be sure if it was just the sound of my own movement or something around me. I managed to duck under the next shower head. This one was higher up on the wall and seemed to be leaking the same liquid that the other one was. I felt like I was moving along something infinite. Even now, then I would, I would have to duck or move under another metal bar, another shower head. They began to pour some, some, to more profusely, but the liquid was too thick to come out easily. The room began to smell. I remember I remember immediately the way that Mr. Mays had described it. I, I grabbed my shirt and I put it over my nose. I tucked onward. It didn't stop the smell for an instant. It smelled like vomit. It smelled like shit. It smelled like, like burnt hair. It smelled like rot. I was still moving against the wall when I... I fell onto some sort of outlet. I, I hit the dirt hard, adrenaline coursing through my veins, the pain still managing to break through. My flashlight still in my hand. I aimed it and I examined my surroundings. Sitting in front of me was a doorway. There was a door there, though. It looked aged now. It had a nice little design on it, a doorknob, a knocker, and it looked like a snarling demon. Red paint was peeling from it, flaking off, falling to the ground in front of me. I clumsily rose and busted through the door, narrowly missing a piece of, of hanging sheet metal in front of me. And I was crawling now. There was no way that I could run. The walls and ceiling were lined with metal, kind you see on the roof of a farm. Large pieces of wood seemed to brace the sheets, holding this makeshift tunnel together. I couldn't risk sliding against that, possibly cutting myself on the metal or hitting the wood and causing a cave-in, so I crawled. I pulled myself for what felt like miles, running into walls every now and then because the path seemed to curve like a snake. I had no idea where I was in relation to the hole that I had fallen through, but I told myself that there was an exit at the end of this. Had I not been crawling, I would have surely hurt myself far worse. There were parts of the tunnel in which the ceiling dipped down to maybe three feet above the ground. It hadn't caved in because the ceiling still lined it. Someone had built it like this. This again, in hindsight, I didn't care at the time. I kept telling myself there was nothing behind me. But I swore I heard feet scraping only inches behind my own. My jeans would brush against my legs every now and then, making it feel like someone was touching me. And even now, I still can't completely convince myself that someone wasn't. 
I crawled and crawled until I reached an, an upslope. With joy, I looked ahead of me. There was a cellar door. The door was made of wood. I knew this because I could see light through them. I, c I couldn't be sure, but I thought... I thought it might be the light from the car's headlights because... Besides all of that, I was just so immensely happy to find an exit. I crawled all the way to the door. I threw my shoulder into it. It budged, but it didn't open. I began to scream, and my throat seared with pain. The most I could manage was a harsh crying noise. It sounded like a dying animal. I, I collapsed in exhaustion and pain, my eyes staring up at the slits of light before me. I was so close to being out of here. I, I could taste it. It was in that moment of silent defeat that I heard noise that was without question something moving in the tunnel. It sounded like something was being dragged along the floor. It would move, pause for a second, move again. I had nothing left in my stomach to throw up. I began to gag. I, I gathered myself slightly, trying to steady my hand enough to focus on the flashlight in the tunnel. What I saw... What I saw, I... I still cannot rationalize. I know what I saw. I can't convince myself it was actually there. I can't stop telling myself it was just a hallucination. I saw I saw a child in a dirty sleeping gown. The gown was stained with something I mean, dark brown and occasionally splashes of deep red. The child was extremely frail like the pictures that people might see of a holocaust victim. I could only make out one eye bright reflecting the light of a flashlight in between huge tufts of long dirty hair. It reached down beyond the fingertips of the child, which were caked with dirt. The boy, uh, the, the girl, or I'm not even entirely sure which, moved towards me with difficulty. He wasn't breathing hard, but it seemed that every movement of every muscle took every ounce of strength the child had. The thing that froze me, though, was the eye. The eye that was only visible because it reflected my flashlight. But even in that glint, I could feel anger, deep hatred, something like it. This is the point in which the English language really lacks the right words to explain the situation. I could, I could tell that this child meant me harm, whether it was a hallucination or not. The thing was, was getting closer. I started to cry. It was getting closer and closer when I heard a voice from behind me. Jack whispered the voice. It was Steve, I was certain. I tried to talk back, fully intending to say, open this up and get me out right now. However, given my current state, I'm, I'm sure it sounded just like a garbled nonsense. I clawed at the door, pushing against it with everything that I had, and finally breaking eye contact with the child. As I did this, the flashlight rolled down the slope, coming to rest somewhere near the child's feet. What do you see? The voice asked. What are you talking about? I closed my eyes. I remember hearing a reply along the lines of, just look at it. Tell me what you see. And my own screams of frustration drowned that out. I was mumbling like a maniac when the voice told me calmly, rest for a second, I'll get it. The statement took me a second to settle in, at which point I closed my eyes tight. Steve, just do it, please, please, just, just open it, please, I whimpered. Just get me out of here. My voice was beginning to get louder. Steve, God damn it! open the fucking wooden door! I opened my eyes for a split second to see nothing. Nothing but black hair dangling in front of my face. A smile glint out of light hidden in the mess of tangles. I slammed my eyes shut. I screamed with every ounce of energy I had. Open the fucking door! The door behind me gave way. And I fell onto the dirt, taking in a breath of fresh air. My eyes were still closed, but the first thing I did was scramble to find the cellar door and close it. And once I had done that, I took a deep breath and opened my eyes, and I saw the barn in front of me, illuminated by the headlights of the car. My head was pulsing with pain. I was, I was covered in dirt and liquids that I didn't even care to know the origin of my... My knees were, were at the very least, dislocated, but... Despite all of that, I, I was out of the tunnel. I took a deep breath, I buried my head in my hands, and I said, Steve, why didn't you just fucking open the door? I waited for a response, but none came. Steve, seriously, he began. I was fucking clawing, I was screaming for my life, I said. 
and I looked behind me. My stomach must have been on the verge of falling out of me at this point because it shifted again. The only thing behind me was the large mass of bushes that I had seen while examining the perimeter of the building. I was angry. Steve, this, this isn't the fucking time! Come out of the fucking bushes! I was getting ready to stand up when I heard a yell from in front of the building. A flashlight bobbed up and down in the semi-darkness. Steve was running into the open door of the structure, yelling my name and telling me not to worry. I must have lost consciousness at that point, because when I stood up, Steve was standing over me, desperately trying to wake me up. His words were almost incoherent, at least to my ears. He helped me to my feet, began to walk me to the car, and as we walked, I saw my flashlight sitting just outside of the cellar door. The light was fading. Steve brought me back to the car and drove me to the nearest hospital. I fell asleep, but he told me that he drove around for an hour before he found the main road. I don't... I don't think I ever told him the whole story. I believe he thinks that I was just injured from the fall. He never... He never really asked me about it. We didn't say... We didn't bother to stay in contact much longer. It's not like we deliberately parted ways. We just sort of stopped hanging out after that trip and we went our separate ways. I've never been able to fully understand what happened that night. So many things I can explain away as being hallucinations. There's still so many things that don't make sense. The shower heads were there. They were leaking something. The door was real. The tunnel was real. Most everything else can be semi-rationalized if I can convince myself that I had a very bad concussion. A very, very bad concussion. But the one thing I can't... I couldn't have imagined... Was that cellar door was locked. It was locked, and then suddenly it wasn't. I'm still skeptical as I've ever been, but I, I believe in what happened to me at the showers. I'm not a hermit or a social, or social retard because of it. I, I drink a lot, but I'm still functioning. I'll never return to Nebraska. No one will ever be able to convince me otherwise. I don't, I don't watch horror movies. There's absolutely nothing entertaining about being so desperately scared. That's it. Really, there's no, there's no typical ending of my story. I was... I was changed by my experience, yeah, but there was no way to change anything about it or, or to fight back against it. I can't even convince myself that it wasn't just, it wasn't just me seeing things. Believe me, I've been trying for years. Prior to this, there was no way to find any information on the showers. The legend didn't extend outside of the classroom of Mr. Mays. No one told stories like like this to keep children away from a certain place would have scared them. It just wasn't known. I guess... And I guess that's that's really the point of the whole story. I, I want people to know firsthand what this place is like. Maybe it's a, a drunk's rationale. Or the, the kid inside me wanting to spread these kinds of stories again. I don't know. I don't care. But, but it's out there now. The people to mold and warp to their needs. Most importantly, it's out of my head. It's getting late. I'm getting another drink. Cheers. <laughs>